Hello students, this is Professor Vicente Saga. Welcome to my class. This is part four presentation of chapter 16. Chapter 16, Dilated Securities and Earnings Per Share. So this is where we left off. Restricted stock plans. We said these are plans that transfer shares of stock to employees subject to an agreement that the shares cannot be so transferred or pledged until the best thing occurs. And here are some of the advantages. Remember we talked about stock options in the last session. Here we are talking about uh, a plan with some restrictions, okay? As here are the major advantages. You can go through that on your own. And um, uh, here is an example of a restricted uh, uh, stock. Uh, let's quickly go through this. This company issued 1,000 shares of restricted stock to the CEO. Uh, the, 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 the stock has a fair value of $20 per share on January 1st, 2014. Additional information is as follows. The service period related to the restricted stock is five years. Vesting occurs if S stays with the company for a, a five year period. That is the restriction right there. The power value of the stock is $1 per share. So the company makes the following entry on the on the date of grant. They debit uh, on end compensation for twenty thousand, and uh, the company credit uh, common stock for one thousand based on the number of shares and the power value, and uh, paid in capital in excess of power nineteen thousand. So I also wanted to. I want to make a note of this. Uh, look at the uh, note here. On end compensation, uh, that is the account that we uh, just debited, represent cost of service or services here to be performed, which is not an asset. So on end compensation is reported as a component of stockholders' equity in the balance sheet. Again, the most important thing is because uh, it is yet to be, the services are yet to be uh, performed. Now, now the journal entry uh, to record the compensation. Compensation expense is four thousand. On end compensation is four thousand for each of the next five years. So four thousand multiplied by five that will give you twenty thousand dollars for the total uh, compensation expense. So we debit compensation expense for four uh, thousand and credit on end compensation for four thousand. So by crediting on end compensation for four thousand every year for five years, at the end of the fifth year the on-end compensation account will be uh, zero. So now, uh, here is the entry to record the, trans the, 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 the transaction in the event of a uh, forfeiture. So we debit a common stock, we debit paid in capital in excess of power for 19,000, we credit the compensation expense for two years that expired for uh, 12,000, then the on-end compensation for uh, 20, for 12,000, for that is for the remaining on end compensation, assuming that the, co uh, the, the CEO uh, uh, leaves the company on February 3rd, 2016. So, employee stock purchase plan, we talked about this uh, before, generally permits all employees to purchase stock at a discounted price for a short period of time. These plans are usually considered compensatory unless they satisfy all three conditions presented below, be before. So, in other words, this is a plan that the company comes with encouraging more employees to buy the company stock in order to for them to have a, a stake in the company and have ownership of the company we said that these plans are considered compensatory unless they satisfy all these three conditions so in other words if these three conditions are there then they are not considered compensatory now so look at number one substantially all full-time employees may participate on an equitable basis in other words, almost everybody can participate. Number two, this discount from market is so small. So in other words, the, what the company is asking you to pay for their stock, you know, based on this plan and what the company stock is actually selling for in the stock market, the difference is very insignificant. And the plan offers no substantive uh, option feature. So disclosure of compensation plans. So you can go through all of these. These are the important uh, issues that need to be disclosed relative to uh, uh, the stock compensation. Now, discuss the controversy involving stock compensation plans. Oh, um, I encourage you to read about uh, this debate over uh, stock option accounting. Now, let's take a look at the second part of chapter 16, that is earnings per share. I guarantee you 
this is the most exciting and the most interesting, or the more interesting of the two issues uh, in this chapter. The first issue, we talk about dilutive securities. The second issue, earnings per share. So like I said, I assure you, I guarantee you, you are going to have more fun uh, listening and uh, dealing with uh, the computation of earnings per share, uh, either in a, uh, in a simple or complex uh, capital structure. Now, here you have it, earnings per share. So uh, uh, in, in, in presentation one, we discussed earnings per share relatively extensively, all right? We said that it indicates the income earned by each share of the common stock. How much is the company making? on behalf of the stockholder for one share that the stockholder has. That is basically what EPS is, is all about. Again, like we said, it's a common denominator. Uh, when you compare EPS of one company to the other, you are comparing apples to apples uh, versus comparing uh, the, the, the profit of the company. So we said companies report any per share only for common stock. When the income statement contains intermediate components, we discuss that in intermediate accounting one. In other words, when you have different section in the income statement, discontinued operation, extraordinary items, so on and so forth, you have to calculate the EPS for each component. Uh, here's an example for you. Moving along, let's take a look at EPS and its per share. We said that when a company's capital structure, well, uh, excuse me, when we said that when a company does not have potentially dilutive securities, Remember, we talked about several dilutive securities in part one of this chapter. When a company does not have any of those securities, for example, convertible preferred stock, convertible bond, stock options, so on and so forth, then we say that the company has a very a, a, a simple capital structure. Now, what, 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 what do we mean by capital structure? Capital structure simply means how your capital is structured. Like we said earlier, here a company has $100 million in total assets. The company, $100 million in social asset, who has claim to it? The creditors versus the owners, okay? Debt versus equity. So how is your capital structured, okay? Now, again, like I said, when a company has no potentially dilutive security, we say that the company has a simple capital structure. However, when a company has securities that could be that can be converted into common stock, we said that the company has a complex capital structure. So again, we talk about dilutives, meaning means the ability to influence the EPS in a downward direction, meaning it dilutes the EPS, it decreases the EPS, so it has the potential to decrease the EPS. So moving along, let's take a look at the calculation of a preferred stock, uh, 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 a simple capital structure. So we are going to talk about how to compute any per share in a simple capital structure, right? Uh, so, look at the basic formula, EPS. This is a little bit more complex than the one that I used to illustrate the overview of EPS in part one presentation. So this is the one that you need to know for your exam. So EPS is calculated as, here's the formula, net income minus preferred dividends divided by Weighted average number of shares outstanding. Now, why are we backing out preferred stock? Excuse me, preferred dividend, meaning the dividend that we pay to preferred stockholders. Uh, <coughs> uh, look at the. Uh, uh, The rule, one of the rules here is that companies report earnings per share only for common stock. Only for common stock. Because of that, we need to back out the preferred dividend from the net income because the net income belongs to the common stockholders and preferred stockholders. So the preferred the, the dividends of the preferred holders, we need to back it out of the net income because the EPS zero in on only uh, uh, zero in on only common stock. Again, let, look at what he said here. Supply the current year preferred stock dividend from net income to arrive at the uh, income available to common stockholders. <coughs> so that is what we do. 
the current year preferred stock dividend is back at. Now, let's take a look at the bottom, uh, the denominator. It says preferred dividends are subtracted on cumulative preferred stock, whether declared or not. I'm, I'm, that is not the denominator here. We are still talking about the numerator. Excuse me. Preferred dividends are subtracted on cumulative preferred stock, whether declared or not. So we already talked about what cumulative uh, 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 preferred stock is. So those are preferred stock uh, that uh, if you buy a cumulative preferred stock, the company is obligated to pay dividends in areas if they are not paid in the current year. So we call that cumulative preferred stock. So here is the rule that you need to know here. Preferred dividends are subtracted on cumulative, pre on cumulative preferred stock, whether declared or not. Only for cumulative preferred stock, not non cumulative preferred stock. Now, moving along, let's take it, let's zero in on the denominator, denominator of, the, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, formula or equation. Weighted average number of shares are standing. This is very important. We said companies must weigh the shares by the fraction of the period they are standing. When stock dividends or share splits occur, companies need to restate the shares are standing before the share dividend or split. So here are a couple of important rules here that you need to know as we dive into how to calculate uh, EPS. So let's take a look at the first one. Companies must weigh the shares by the fraction of the period that they are standing. What does that mean? Listen to this very carefully. Let's assume that uh, at the beginning of the year, we have 100,000 shares at the beginning of the year. In November, we issued additional, this is January, in November, we issued additional 100,000 shares. So at the end of the year, we have 200,000 shares, all right? Now, look at this. The capital that we received from issuing 100 shares in November was not available for the company for the whole year. The related capital was only available for the company to operate, to generate net income, only for November and December. And don't forget now the numerator of the equation, net income, is from January through December. All right? So from that standpoint, the number of outstanding shares at the end of the year cannot be used for this calculation because, like I said, the related capital was not available for the whole year. Therefore, we have to compute the weighted average numbers of shares outstanding. So you really need to know how to do this because it is likely that you are going to have one or two questions on the examination asking you to compute, asking you to calculate the weighted average number of shares outstanding, which is different from asking you to compute EPS. In other words, you have to deal with everything. All right. So moving along, let's take a look at the second uh, rule that we need to know here. It's uh, when the stock dividends or stock fees occur, companies need to restate the shares outstanding before the share dividend or split. What does that mean? That simply means when we issue stock dividend, remember we talked about stock dividend in the previous chapter, or we do a, 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 a share split. The assumption is, if we do that during the year, the assumption is we actually did it at the beginning of the year. So therefore, we have to restate the shares outstanding before the stock dividend or split. So we are going to take a look at how we apply those rules in a minute. So moving along, let's take a look at an example here. Here we are still zeroing in on how to calculate the weighted average shares outstanding. This company has the following changes in its common stock during the year. Take a look at what happened. January 1, beginning balance, 90,000. April 1st, issued 30,000 shares for cash, 30. At that point, they have 120,000 shares. July 1st, purchased 39 shares. 
That is treasury stock. They buy back 39 shares. So 39, at that point, they have 81,000 shares. November 1st, issued 60,000 shares for cash. Now they have one for the one. The question is, let's compute the weighted average number of shares are standing at the end of the year. All right, it's not one for the 1,000 because we are going to do the uh, uh, weight, the average. So January 1st, from January 1st through April 1st, 90,000 shares. We only have 90,000 shares for three uh, months of the year. So 312, that will give us 22,500. From April 1 through July 1st, we have 120 shares. That is this 120 shares for only three months again. That will give us 30,000. From July 1 through November 1, we have 81,000, okay? That is 4, 4 divided by 12, that will give us 27,000. Then from November 1st through December 31st, we have 141,000. So we have 141,000 shares only for two months of the year. So that is 212, that will give us 23,500. So the weighted average number of shares is 103,000. So that will be the conclusion of uh, chapter four, uh, part four presentation.